morning. Um, for those of you that don't yet know the Food Foundation, um, we're a new independent think tank working on food policy. We're especially focused on um, food system policies which play a role in shaping our diets and health. We published our first report a few weeks ago called Force Fed. There are lots of copies here. It focuses on a typical family in Britain and um, how the food system shapes their choices and asks the question about whether they're really, um, how hard it is or how easy it is for them to choose a healthy diet. And we conclude that it's pretty difficult and, and we call upon the government to, to show much more leadership across the food system in trying to make healthy eating easier for us all. Um, do read it. Um, there are little cards which you can pass on to other people with our infographic on, which is on the wall on the side up there as well. Um, we'd also love you to tweet about today's event. Um, our speakers are just up here. We'll go back to those in a moment. But here's our, our website as well where our new report is, is on. And we'll also have a report of today's um, today's event with recordings on our YouTube channel as well. Um, so do keep, keep in touch through that. Um, and you're all very warmly invited to, enjoy, to join us for a glass of wine afterwards, of course, and hopefully enjoy the amazing views. Um, many of our trustees are here, as well as our expert advisors, and we'd really like to hear your thoughts on how today's event was, um, what, what, what went well and what went, didn't go so well, and um, your advice on going forward for the Food Foundation. And we've also got evaluation forms, and we'd really like to hear your feedback because we do read a lot of it and try and use it for our, for our subsequent events. So, um, to get to the matter in hand, um, the government's about to launch its childhood obesity strategy. This could be a historic moment for us in the UK. Um, I'm sure many of us here hope that it will be, and I think today's presenters will highlight some of the reasons why the government really needs to seize this moment and um, set the UK on a better course. But also today's discussion will show us why the independent tracking of progress on nutrition, whether it's obesity rates, whether it's breastfeeding rates, whether it's uptake of the Healthy Start program, whether it's the composition of processed foods, why all of that data and information is really critical in keeping commitments on track and holding the government's feet to the fire. Commitments are great, of course, and we hope that they'll be really bold and comprehensive in the coming strategy, but we know too that promises aren't always kept and that the transparent tracking of those commitments is a crucial element of holding governments to account and one which we should all be actively calling for. We've got some really fantastic speakers for you today. First up is um, all the way from New Zealand, and the reason why we have this fantastic venue is um, <laughs> Professor Boyd Swinburne. We're really thrilled he's here. He has many roles and titles internationally, which I won't do justice to, but we're, um, he's one of the authors of the uh, Lancet's Obesity Series. He's one of the members of the Global Nutrition Report's independent expert group, and we'll be hearing more about that today. And he's also one of the pioneers of the Food Environment Policy Index. Please give a warm welcome to Boyd. Okay, thank you very much, and thanks for the invitation to come here. I'm not sure that I had anything to do with uh, being in New Zealand House, but uh, um, it is a nice view from here, isn't it? Um, I didn't know that your government was going to do a nutri um, child nutrition strategy or child obesity strategy. Um, that's, that's interesting. We waited for bated breath for some months in New Zealand for our minister to come out with his, um, his strategy. And in New Zealand, we have the Prime Minister's Chief Science Advisor, Sir Peter Gluckman, who uh, was the co-chair or is the co-chair of the um, WHO ECHO, the um, um, Commission for Ending Childhood Obesity. We were expecting great things. I have to say the Minister's plan that came out is not going to put New Zealand at the forefront of any um, childhood obesity action, I have to say, so um, I hope yours is considerably stronger. So um, I've, I'm going to talk a little bit about tracking progress on, on food and nutrition policies um, in general. I'm going to um, just talk a little bit about the, uh, the imperatives, why, why do we need to do it, what are the priority policies, 
and the progress being made globally, um, but spend most of the time talking about strengthening accountability and um, this, uh, this, this group Informus, this network Informus was mentioned, I'll talk a bit about that and um, some thoughts about quasi-regulatory approaches. And I'm going to finish on actually the importance of UK leadership in this space. Um, a lot of the world does look to the UK in this space. Uh, you might find that a bit, bit of a worry, but actually it's <laughs> it, it, is, it is true that the UK is a leader and we like to see it out there. So this, uh, this paper in um, 2012 by, by Lim uh, and uh, a bunch of his colleagues from um, the Global Burden of Disease Group uh, really lifted the whole issue of the, the global burden of, of nutrition. It's the first time that they had combined the nutrition risk factors, so it was 67 risk factors modeled for the contribution to the global burden of disease, and for the first time they sort of joined them together. There might be a little bit of mathematical magic in how they actually did that, I have to say, but um, the fact that collectively um, dietary risk factors accounted for about 10% of, of global burden, that was the highest out of all of the risk factors, and I think that gave us a real boost that this is, this is absolutely critical to get right. Um, compared to globally, um, high blood pressure next, was next at 7% and smoking 6.3%, and for those countries um, like yours and mine where smoking is going down and obesity is going up, um, these numbers, uh, the, the dietary risk factors is only going to get higher and uh, we've already crossed the, uh, the, the burden um, some, some years ago in New Zealand. Um, as you know, that's going to result in increased um, uh, type 2 diabetes, healthcare costs and reduced quality of life. For childhood obesity, of course, when, you, when you're looking at the burden of childhood obesity, um, it's not until many years later that you count the cost when it hits diseases like uh, type 2 diabetes and, and drives the healthcare cost. But all along the way, obesity does reduce quality of life in obese kids, and we need to factor that into the actual cost of, um, of the problem for children. So if this is, if this is diets here about, uh, that, that are creating this burden, unhealthy diets, um, how do we how do we kind of get there? And this is the schema that um, that we've been using about how um, food environment how we um, um, conceptualise the food environments. We 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 interact with the food environment with our own individual factors, our preferences and and um, age and uh, uh, cultural background and so on, and interact with the food environments, the physical environment. Um, the cost, the economic environment, the policy, the rules, and the culture. And that interaction ends up in our diets. And these are the big players in terms of influencing food environments. There's the government, which, uh, food industry rather, which has an influence on products placement, price and promotion, very powerfully so. Um, government has a role in, in regulations and laws setting the boundaries. Um, and fiscal policies and a little bit in health promotion, although in general that's not a patch on uh, the promotion of the food industry and of course um, society in terms of culture and cuisine. But it's these two big players here that I think we need to pay most attention to around trying to influence uh, the environment for healthy diets. So um, what, what needs to be done? Well, actually this is quite an easy question to answer because there's been a lot of reports that tell us what needs to be done and this is the latest one is the ending childhood obesity. They all kind of say the same thing, yes they change a little bit over the years but they're all saying the same things as global consensus, they agree at WHA, this is going to go to WHA in, the, in, um, in, in May and that's going to be approved and then we've got another whole set of 40 or 50 or however many recommendations in there that, um, that countries are supposed to do. So I think there's roaring consensus in general about what we need to do and a lot of food environment interventions in there. Um, and there's also monitoring frameworks now. So WHO is getting smarter about the accountability uh, processes and developing um, um, targets and monitoring frameworks. Um, and this is the monitoring framework, 25 indicators. 
A lot of it is downstream. They're measuring down at the mortality, morbidity, risk factors uh, in behaviors, and not much at the food environments level. Um, only two indicators, marketing to children and policies to limit uh, saturated fat and, um, and trans fat. Um, compared to the size of the burden that the food environments are placing and creating with um, unhealthy diets, it's a relatively small number of indicators. And this is part of the reason for uh, wanting to strengthen the, that whole um, uh, monitoring of food environments. So I'll come back to that <coughs> later in relation to Informus, but this is the kind of monitoring background, I guess, that we're trying to complement and, uh, and support. So just to look at the progress and what progress uh, countries have been making since the onset of all those reports. Um, in the Lancet series on obesity that was published uh, uh, last, last year, um, that was the second series, um, the first paper in that looked at progress over about the 10 years from, uh, from the, when the um, um, global action on, on diet and physical activity was launched. And the fact that no country has turned around the obesity epidemic tells us quite a few things. It's, it tells us it's a tough job to do, but it also tells us that um, all countries are in this together. We don't, we don't have any solutions. We're, if we might be rich countries, but uh, uh, we don't have the answers. If, um, if, if countries like uh, uh, Vietnam want to know about what to do about uh, reducing smoking or car accidents or whatever, and they can come and learn. Uh, they can come and learn from countries, wealthy countries. They can't come here and learn about how to deal with obesity and how to turn it around because actually we haven't done it. So we are actually all in this together um, of all countries. Um, there are some countries showing flattening declines in some child populations, so this is encouraging. But of course, the first populations out of this epidemic are young, white, high SES girls. Um, and you know, then other ones will follow. Uh, maybe the boys might follow next. But what that means, if we, leave, if we leave it up to what's largely happening at the moment, which is, um, which is publicity and the media and things, and that will get picked up by certain sector of soci sectors of society and the disparities will increase as, as uh, they continue to, to get uh, over increase overweight and obesity. Um, some countries are introducing food policy and p food policies and um, I'd like to acknowledge Corinna's work and the work of WCRF in putting together this nourishing framework and the examples of countries that have done well and, and, and serve as global exemplars. I think that's actually really important evidence, that's really important information, and uh, is quite stimulating, I think, for, uh, for some countries. And it's very important also for our monitoring and benchmarking. So um, that is valuable uh, information, and um, I certainly hope that's going to be uh, kept up to date on a regular basis. So there are some good examples there, but honestly, for 10 years of all those reports and all those recommendations, there's not a great, uh, it's not a great track record. So why has there been so little progress on, on uh, healthy food policies? And uh, we, we uh, discussed this a lot a couple of years ago at, um, at, a, at a meeting in Bellagio with a lot of um, countries, low middle income countries because they are in exactly the same boat. And we came up with sort of three groups of reasons. The first is, um, is food industry actions and, and opposition or, um, or, or kind of heading, heading um, actions off at the past with their own self-regulatory codes. Um, so that's, that's, that's a big um, set of reasons. And I don't know if any of you have read uh, Marion Nessel's book, Soda Wars, which uh, just came out uh, last year, where she uh, documents in, in, in excruciating detail um, how the, the soda companies have been fighting, fighting the battle against public health um, at every step of the way. But it's, uh, it's a bit sobering reading. Um, 
<clears throat> the second is lack of government leadership. Now, there are countries that have relatively weak governance systems and conflicts of interest that can't um, the struggle to get anything done in a leadership way, uh, let alone battle industry. Um, but even, even countries with uh, strong governance systems, there may, be, uh, there may be governments in power, like the one we happen to have in New Zealand at the moment, that has a uh, deep belief in education as the answer and a belief in market systems as, as the solutions. And if that's the deep belief, then they're not certainly not going to um, implement a lot of those recommendations which go a little bit beyond education. And also unwillingness to um, take on, to battle the food industry, this, this chill effect. And uh, we, s we saw in, um, in Australia, well, when, I, when I was there, the huge political capital it took for the Australian government just to get one single policy through of uh, plain packaging for tobacco. The enormous amount of political capital that they had to burn just to get one policy through. And we're asking them to do 15 things and battle the food industry on each front. You know, it's no wonder that politicians are a little bit reluctant um, to do that. We have to understand what effort that takes. And the third is the lack of um, sufficient public demand for policies. Now, when you do, when you do polls, um, and you've, you've had some of these uh, recently here, um, in general, there's quite a high majority support for a lot of the policies that are being promoted. Uh, even, I don't know what the, what the support is like here for sugar sweetened beverage taxes, but in New Zealand, um, it's now a majority that, uh, that support that, even taxes. Um, so there is support there, but it's a quiet support. It's not, it doesn't end up on the minister's desk. It's, not, a, it's not, a, not translated into pressure for change. So we've got a job to do with um, lifting the, uh, the pressure for change. The other thing um, that came out of this series of, um, of, of reports, and a, a series of Lancet series on obesity, I'm not going through all of them, I'm just uh, cherry picking here, but uh, one of the things that's very relevant to what we're talking about um, tonight is around accountability systems and the need to shift from responsibility pledges to accountability. And that's a fundamentally different dynamic. Um, responsibility is me standing here saying I'm responsible, I'm going to pledge to do something, and if I do it, uh, well, then that's good on me, but if I don't, um, nobody can hold me to account. That's, that's the responsibility approach. Um, accountability means there are multiple parties involved, there are agreed actions, there, there are power relationships, so that if I don't do what I said I was going to do, then some other second party can, can hold me to account. So it is a different, it's a different uh, dynamic. And this issue of independent versus mutual accountability um, is, is important as well. Um, mutual accountability, a degree of independence um, adds uh, strength, I think, to accountability systems. <coughs> this was the framework uh, that we used, developed by um, Vivica Krak, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a robust uh, way of thinking about accountability. Um, at the centre, you have to have a set of agreed things that people are, uh, are going to do and said they're going to do. Um, the first job is to take the account, so let's measure what people said they were going to do, people or companies or uh, organisations. Um, so that's taking the account. And for a researcher like me, uh, we're very used to that, designing surveys and, and taking those measures. Then uh, communicating it and sharing it. And uh, as a scientist, I have to put up my hand and said, actually, we're not very good at that. Um, communicating our results and our evidence is something we need to learn a lot about. And I think we'll be hearing about it, this from, from Inga about the process that, that she's going through with uh, dealing with companies and working with companies, getting that information to them in a way that, um, that, is, that is useful and, uh, and engaging. Um, the holding to account is where the power relationships come in, and this is tough. And it's tough for people from civil society because we don't have much power. Most of the power resides um, uh, you know, with government or with the, with the private sector. But that's not to say that civil society, uh, professional groups, um, the public are, not, uh, are powerless. They're not, we're not. Um, but it's a, it's a multitude of small, smaller uh, types of power. And then, of course, uh, responding to the account and improving it. So I think going through that, um, going through that approach is, 
is is, uh, is has been very helpful. Now I've, that's interesting. I've got um, another set of slides up on my. <laughs> now I've got now I've got the same one. No, it's doing the same thing it did before, Alex, and uh, <laughs> jumping on <laughs> jumping on to another slideshow. <laughs> We've got, we got two lots up or something. Okay. So we just start start from the beginning, do we? There we are. Okay. All right. <laughs> you quite know what's happening up here. Um, okay. What? So when when we come, sorry, just to go back here. <coughs> If we are if we are, if we are taking if we are creating evidence and we are, we're collecting evidence, um, what is the type of evidence that um, that, that that persuades uh, agents to change, persuades um, change agents, uh, um, decision makers to to make change? Well, it's a bit different actually to the type of evidence that I would normally collect and do as in regular research. Um, and that's why I've kind of personally shifted into the space of monitoring and benchmarking um, because I think measurements of progress for things that are under people's jurisdiction um, does speak to them much more loudly than, uh, than a lot of the other work that scientists do and publish in uh, prestigious journals that decision makers never read. Um, case studies of successful changes, and that's why the nourishing framework and those examples are so critical. Evidence of impact and support, stories, and, it's, um, and, and visits and personal recommendations. It's amazing how powerful a lot of this, a lot of that is, um, and we need to be aware of that and publish those. And evidence of, of impact of policies and actions, and I guess um, this is a place where research is a little bit more comfortable in, in measuring changes and so on. But we, we, we ignore these things which might not seem like high-powered research, monitoring and benchmarking and developing case studies. Uh, we might not see that as highly sophisticated research, but that is, that is, uh, that is persuasive evidence. So just to then take you to this, uh, to, to how we're trying to deal with that um, and create a, um, create a, uh, a, um, a global network of public interest organisations and researchers to try to measure it. So we have this Informus network. Um, we started in 2012. Uh, we have protocols up and running and there's about 17 countries at the moment uh, using, using these modules. I'll skip the objectives. Um, this is this is the framework. So we have we have modules for measuring um, public sector policies. What's the government doing, and how they're progressing? What's the private sector doing, and working with uh, Inga on that. And then at the moment, seven different food environment um, uh, modules. So uh, what's what are the changes in food composition, food labelling, marketing, food provision, particularly in schools, food retail prices, and food trade and investment. And we also hope to look at population diet. So, quite a lot of um, quite a lot of activity, um, a lot of different modules. Um, but in the end, I think these are all bite-sized ones that can be done um, relatively cheaply and on a regular basis. So, this one here, I'll just give you an example of what that looks like for for New Zealand when we when we measured the New Zealand government based on uh, across 40 different um, indicators on how their progress was on food monitoring, uh, on food uh, policies and infrastructure. So this is the New Zealand government's um, score sheet, if you like, 20-odd um, indicators on, um, on, on food policies and then 20-odd indicators on, uh, on infrastructure and things like uh, leadership, things like monitoring 
um, governance, uh, funding and resources, platforms for interaction and so on. So trying to think about things that are policy relevant that government could, uh, could do. And then turning those, turning those implementation gaps into potential priorities for action. And this was a whole process we went through with, with um, uh, public health people, with NGOs, um, government were observers, government, saw, uh, government work, we worked with government the whole time to make sure the evidence was correct and that the process was fair and came out with a set of top priorities, which we could have probably sat down and written at the start, but that, that, that is a little bit um, negating the whole process and the value of the process. Um, just, uh, just a word on quasi-regulatory systems. Um, in public health, we tend to talk a lot about regulation. We're, we're very keen on regulation because that's the maximum levels of leader, uh, leverage for accountability. Um, industry hates it with a passion. Um, and so I think we need to be much more sophisticated thinking about quasi-regulatory systems. Where, where, where voluntary initiatives are strengthened to make them more accountable and credible and feasible, transparent and effective for public health. So there are various mechanisms for that. They include the involvement of government. If government is engaged, we've had, we went through this process in New Zealand and Australia to develop a health star rating system. Government set the policy objectives, manage the process, determine the parameters um, for these, the, 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 the mark, um, does the monitoring, threat of regulation, all those things take what was otherwise a bit of a fuzzy-wuzzy um, uh, voluntary commitment and puts, um, puts uh, um, constraints around it. So um, just finally, let me wrap up by saying um, how important the UK is in, in terms of leadership for, uh, for public health and for public health nutrition. There is a strong track record of public health actions. I'm not going to go through all of the areas because I'm sure I'd miss out somebody, but there is enormous capacity and leadership uh, in, this, in this room and in this country. Um, the, the England's National Child Measurement Program is a, is a standout and gives you very detailed information about, uh, about progress here, and I think that is, that is world standard. Um, just finally, future directions. Um, I think uh, next week we, we're, uh, we're starting the Lancet Commission on Obesity, which is the next stage uh, following these two Lancet series. We aim to strengthen the monitoring progress, monitoring progress for accountability and also diving down much more deeply into the underlying causes and solutions um, for obesity. So uh, we're still um, looking, uh, trying to hold accountability uh, centre stage. So just to conclude, um, the current burden of, of unhealthy diets is very high. Future threats from climate change and population growth are going to add to that. I didn't get into any of that, but that's, that's further reason for having a robust um, food strategy and policies. Accountability systems are needed to um, speed up progress. Um, excellent opportunities to build on the expertise you already have here. So thank you very much. Um, buy one and get um, type 2 diabetes free. <laughs> <laughs> you have those buy one, get one free, don't you hear? Anyway, thank you very much indeed for your patience and sorry to go a bit off time. Thank you so much, Boyd. That was really great. Um, we're going to move straight on now to... Would like to sit over there? Yeah, yeah, just sit at the panel over there. Oh, okay. Uh, to um, Lawrence Haddad, um, who I'm really thrilled is here today. Um, Lawrence is um, co-author um, and chair of the Independent Expert Group, which writes the Global Nutrition Report. Um, he co-chairs co that with Corinna, who will be um, chairing the second half of tonight tonight's um, event. Um, Lawrence has really been at the forefront of international nutrition for many, many years, um, but I think has been really critical in trying to change the narrative around all forms of malnutrition, undernutrition, overweight and obesity, and trying to forge a kind of policy direction and accountability around that narrative, and it's really been um, incredible leadership. So, um, Lawrence, please do come and tell us about the Global Nutrition Reform. Um, thanks, Anna. It's great to be here. Um, if I drift off, it's because I'm looking at the 
the fun fantastic. I'm already drifting off. <laughs> looking at the <laughs> looking at the fantastic view behind me. Um, um, as as Anna said, I co-chair uh, this.